Sandler, the host of the Radical Candor podcast. And we're back with another Radically Candid conversation. This week, Kim is speaking with Annie Jean-Baptiste. She's the head of product inclusion at Google and author of the new book, Building for Everyone. Expand your market with design practices from Google's product inclusion team. It is my very great honor to share with you all a conversation between myself and Annie Jean-Baptiste. Annie had a meteoric rise at Google, and I got to know Annie when she volunteered to help me make sure that the next book that I'm writing is more inclusive. And Annie, you made my book so much better, so thank you. And uh, I don't think I've said this to you yet, but my college roommate, was also on that document. She called me and she said, who is that? Who is that Annie? She's so smart. You really need to listen to what she says. So thank you. Well, no, thank you. I was honored to do it. And that's a really big compliment. So I appreciate it. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if most listeners understand how hard what you did at Google was. Not only did you get promoted very, very quickly, you also moved from sales to product which almost no one has been able to do. So tell us a little bit about your role at Google, and then I want to jump into your your book, which you're about to publish. Sure. So I started at Google um, in the global business organization um, and then moved to the diversity team. And I think while I was on the diversity team, it was clear to me and, and a few other people that there was an opportunity to kind of expand how we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think, you know, a lot of times we focus on the internal pieces, which are very important, right? Like culture and representation. But I think they're also important because we're building for so many people all over the world and the, all those people have different backgrounds, perspectives, walks of life. And so we can't assume that we know what people need without speaking to them and yes. making sure that they have a piece of the process and you're co-creating. And so that's really where product inclusion started. It was about how do we bring the voices that have historically been at the margins or historically been underrepresented or not represented into the center at these kind of critical phases in the product design process. It's not just a checklist, right? It's about thinking through where are their key kind of process points where we might need to ask who else, we might need to bring a more inclusive lens and that that outcome when you do bring more underrepresented backgrounds into the fold, the outcome is actually better for everyone, not just those users, because a lot of times when someone is signaling that something isn't as inclusive as it could be, when you do kind of fix that or build and co-create with them, it actually will cascade. The curbed cut effect happens where um, something that was made for underrepresented group when it started actually benefits almost everyone. So the curb cut effect is when we decided to build out in the curb for people who are in wheelchairs, we all benefit from those, whether we're riding a bike or pushing a stroller or so it was really vital as it turned out for everyone. And we just didn't realize it. So Annie, one of the things I love about your book is that while it's about how to build products, it's also about how to build cultures. It's a book about everything. For our podcast listeners who aren't in product and aren't in tech, but who are working somewhere or maybe not working somewhere, but trying to build more inclusive communities. How should they approach this book? Yeah, I think, you know, for people that aren't working in tech or in product, I think anytime you are creating something where someone else is the recipient or someone else is consuming, you have to kind of build with empathy first, right? And so it doesn't have to be a physical thing or physical output. It's really about stepping outside yourself, I think, and and thinking concretely about how you can make someone feel seen and uplifted. I think, you know, we, we have a few case studies in the book from different industries. So we have of someone who is, you know, an executive in media and, and him talking about how he brought different voices and different accents into the fold. Talk to a few people in the fashion industry and thinking about, you know, size diversity or even physical spaces, right? When someone comes into a, a store, for example, what is the experience like? Is everything accessible? So I think it's really about, you know, when we say product inclusion, product is the end result of whatever you're creating. And how do you kind of ask who else and broaden who else can consume it and feel like they were thought of in the process. We're going to talk a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but can you kind of parse that DEI? What What's the difference between diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, so I think diversity is the variation between groups, right? The differences that make us who mm-hmm. they are. I think equity is about being fair and impartial in terms of access and opportunity. So something can be diverse or 
but not equitable, right? So if I don't have the same access to opportunity, I don't have the same potential for outcomes. It's not an equitable experience. It's not an equitable environment. I think inclusion is all around making sure people feel like they're part of the team. So you can have a team, like if I was, let's say, playing basketball, right? I could have a team of people who come from different backgrounds, they're different ages, they're different races, they're different genders. Like that's a diverse team. But if I'm always feeling like the outsider and I don't feel like I can speak up, I don't feel like I'm getting past the ball, that's not an inclusive environment because we don't all feel like we are a collective. What advice do you have for people who work in organizations that haven't focused on building products or on inclusion. How can people put these ideas in your book into practice if they're working in an environment that maybe isn't so inclusive? How can they begin to crack the door open? I think the first thing is to just look for perspectives outside of your own or your team's own, right? So it doesn't always have to be this like huge endeavor. But if you're a team that's creating something, have you asked people from HR, from marketing? Have you asked yes. an intern? Have you asked you know, the receptionist at the front desk? Because everyone is going to come with perspectives and backgrounds that are different from yours, right? And I think a lot of times we think something is super clear or we think something is super valuable because we're in it all day long. Like this happened even with editing. I was like, oh, yeah, I think this is like everyone's going to understand this, right? And my editor was like, I have no idea what this means. And because <laughs> you're so steeped in it, right, it's in your head, you get it, but that doesn't mean everyone else gets it. So I would say the first like very easy step is, you know, a few times a year when you're, you know, having ideation sessions or you're putting together a business plan, bring people who are not the usual suspects, quote unquote, into it and really listen to what their feedback is. And not only listen to the feedback, but try to build it into plan and, and change the outcome of what you are going to create. Right. I think it's really important not just to ask for feedback, right? You need to do something with that feedback. You need to act upon it. I think the second thing is just to see where you can get different perspectives. If you're already doing research, for example, thinking through, do I only do research in major cities? Do I only do research in the city uh, where I live? Do I only do research with people who speak English as a first language? So just starting to parse out again across just different dimensions, whether it be gender, age, race, ability, um, geography, uh, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, to say, who else can I ask? to see how my my view broadens or shifts, right? And to be open to it shifting. You know, we have a, a team that uh, literally just, you know, picks up and gets in a, in a van and goes to, you know, different shopping malls or road races and things like that just to get perspectives from people that aren't in Mountain View, for example. You just really have to continue to ask who else, and it can be big or small, but I think it's just important to kind of take that first step. When you're in a creative endeavor, I always say the second hardest thing is getting into your head, but the very hardest thing is getting back out. And in order to get out of our own way, we need other people and we need people who observe the world differently, who have a different perspective than we do. Um, so tell us a little bit about the book. So uh, the book is called Building for Everyone. The long subtitle is to expand your market with design practices from Google's product inclusion team. And it's really starting to share some learnings um, that we've found across the company as to how to build inclusively, right? What I'll say is we're definitely on a journey. This is new and, and we're not there yet, right? But I think it's important to um, start the conversation around how do you bring in multiple perspectives, right? We look at 12 dimensions of diversity and the intersections of those dimensions. And so I think it's really important to make sure that you're thinking holistically about users and, and you're figuring out and being intentional about bringing those perspectives into the fold. Uh, and also just really having a cognitive shift, I think, around why diversity, equity, inclusion is important. It is the right thing to do. And if you're building for any types of users or consumers, they most likely have differences that make them different from you. And so how do you make sure that you're actually building for them and with them? And the with them piece, I think, is really important. Yeah, I love that. That was something you pointed out when you were reading my book. We build for everyone with everyone, and then we build better products. So one of the things I really admire about your book is you talk about the human reasons to do this, but also the business reasons to do this. How did you get that balance right? Because you don't want to say, well, there's a moral reason, but that's not that important. The real important thing is, is the business. But at the same time, when you talk about the business reason, you don't want to lose the moral, the moral reason. How, how did you think about that? 
you know, both of those things are important. And I think you can do well and do good. Like those aren't mutually exclusive. I think that, you know, when you look at Google's mission to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, right? It's the universal piece that we're really leading into. So no matter where you come from, what race you are, who you love, how old you are, how much money you make, all of those things that make you who you are, right? You should feel thought of and seen and validated when you use a product. And so I think that blends both the business and the human case. I think when you look at the world and, and how things are shifting and shifting rapidly, right, it really behooves a business to think about groups that have been historically underrepresented. I think that there's a, a misconception that underrepresented groups don't have power, and that's just not true. When you think about even women, for example, women are actually 50% of the population, so for them to be underrepresented, quote unquote, yeah. is funny, but also yeah. we know that not all products have been built, you know, with women in mind and for and with women. And so when you think about women having trillions in purchasing power, making a lot of household decisions, if you're not building for that person, like they can choose to engage or not engage. And so I think it's really about the why behind that. Of course, you want to kind of lean into and fulfill a user's need, but also you want to make sure that someone, when they pick up something, they feel like they were thought of in the process, right? That's a very inclusive and powerful thing to do when you're building. And I think that if you kind of ask yourself, that is the core of why you create something, right? You want people to feel validated. You want people to have their lives be powered in a different way, be easier, whatever kind of tenants you're kind of building for. And that should happen for everyone. It shouldn't just happen for someone who's similar to you or someone who you think is your quote unquote target user, because you can definitely always expand that and ask who else. One of the things you said a moment ago was that you sort of were looking at 12 different dimensions of diversity and inclusion. What are those dimensions? And say more also about the intersection of them. I think a lot of people who are familiar with the academic literature know what intersectionality means, but a lot of people don't know about intersectionality. Sure. So first, the 12 dimensions, and I always forget one, so I'm going okay. to try I'm to get the 12. <laughs> um, so race, um, ethnicity, age, ability, socioeconomic status, education, geography, culture, religion, sexual orientation. Gender. Gender. Thank you. Okay, I'm missing one more. But yeah, I think that it's important to think through multiple dimensions, right? And there's nuance. So when you're building a certain product, there might be some dimensions that are going to like over index, right? Or you really need to be intentional about thinking. And in other cases, it's going to look different. That being said, I think not one dimension makes someone who they are, right? So I always say to product teams, you know, I'm a black woman, I'm left-handed. I'm not black on Monday, a woman on Tuesday, left-handed on Wednesday, (laughs) right? Like I'm always a left-handed black woman. That being said, if I'm using scissors, obviously being left-handed is what is going to kind of over index and like what a team would focus on, right? If I'm using a camera um, at night or something like that, being black and my skin tone is going to over-index, or maybe um, if I'm using some sort of technology, being black and a woman are going to intersect. So it's really about thinking, again, holistically about a user and also helping teams expand, right? I think teams have started to think about building with inclusion in mind, but I think when you're first starting out, it can sometimes feel a little bit overwhelming. You know, 12 dimensions, like I, I have so many other things yeah. I'm focusing on. You know, I have a launch in a month. Like, how do I how do I think about all those things? And so I think what's also important with intersectionality is to remember that even with dimensions that you have started to prioritize, you can always expand. So if you're thinking about accessibility, right, there are people of color with disabilities. There are older people with disabilities. Yeah. There are people who live outside of the U.S. with disabilities, right? So you've already started to bring intersectionality into the fold, but you kind of have to continue asking who else and widening the circle One of the things you did for my book, and I imagine you do this at Google all day long, but you pointed out to me that I tend to use, for example, the word C as kind of a sloppy metaphor in an ableist way. And it was a really important point. I was glad you brought it up because another one of the editors of the book is a historian who's blind. And the last thing in the world I want to do is cause harm to him, somebody I respect and I like a lot. And I really thought... I was aware of it. And then right before I sent the book in for copy edits, I did a search on the word C. And you know how many, it was, the book is, um, is maybe 300 pages. You know how many times I had inappropriately used the word C? 99 times. It was really unbelievable. And so it was not at all hard to fix, but I think there's this idea of some of the ways that we use language and some of our biases are so are so deeply ingrained that we're not aware of them. And then we get made aware of them and we think we're aware and then we're not, we're still not aware. 
How do you deal with that as you're working with the team to help them be more aware of these different areas of inclusion? Yeah, I think the first thing is to have a, a shared language and a shared framework. I can't assume that everyone knows what product inclusion means or what yes. kind of in, goes into the 12 dimensions, right? So you, you have to have kind of a baseline shared language and framework. And I think the second thing is is to be humble, right? Like we all have language that we've fallen back on or is just part of like common quote unquote vernacular that we don't realize can be harmful or just you know uncomfortable for certain underrepresented groups and so i think having humility and knowing that you're going to step in it sometimes and being able to kind of receive that feedback and commit to doing better right like that happens to me all the time where you know I, i'm thinking that it's something you know i'm doing pretty good and someone from another Kind of underrepresented communities like actually i need you to be doing this and like here's where you didn't do that correctly and i think that's all about you know building muscle right when you go to the gym and you first start going to the gym it, it's hard it's terrible you don't want to but yeah. you start to get stronger it starts to get easier and so i think people also need to just remember that this is kind of a learning arc it's a journey i'm gonna wake up one day and be like i am completely inclusive and equitable across language right. across product across everything but yeah i think it's definitely worth kind of figuring out what stuff that we say that we feel is innocuous and like how it can impact others the intent like you said a lot of times most of the time is not harmful or malintended that being said the impact is what we should focus on yes yeah and i mean if if i were running a business and i were saying oh well i intended to be profitable like that would get me exactly nowhere right we need almost more like a, a growth mindset around issues of diversity and inclusion and i and i think Usually when we talk about a growth mindset, we're talking about math skills or something. <laughs> it's hard to develop a growth mindset around math skills, but it's much harder, at least I find it more difficult, around issues of diversity and inclusion. Because when I make a mistake, I'm not just making a math mistake. I'm making a mistake that feels like I've done something that's immoral. And of course I know I'm not a saint. It's much harder not to feel shut down by shame when I when I realize I've done something immoral. So how do you help teams move through that? How can we create teams on which we can have a growth mindset around issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion? The first thing is to just treat product inclusion like any other part of the product design process. And yes. you're always iterating. You're you're going to find mistakes. You're going to find bugs, right? And so yeah. you need to bring that mindset to this type of work. I think the second thing is it's about resilience. You have to understand that you may stumble and get back up because we're leading towards a North Star. And the North Star is to build for everyone and to build as inclusively as we can, right? So if you remember that is the end goal, I think it sometimes can be a little bit easier to kind of pick yourself back up once you've stumbled. And I think that it's really important for teams to have the conversation regularly, but definitely in the beginning to say, this is going to be uncomfortable. Like there are going yes. to be conversations that we have that are going to make you feel uncomfortable. They are intended to do that. And they're intended to push us forward to get the majority team, if not all the team on board with the fact that like we're building muscle around this and it's not going to be easy sometimes but you can't fix things if you haven't named them if you're moving around talking about race and you're you're not saying black right like yes. there's no way that you can <laughs> fix that yeah. because you can't you don't have know what you're talking about right so like the first thing i think is shared language shared framework second is to have conversations and name it and name it in a safe space right like when we were doing work with our cameras and, and camera sensors, we spoke to an engineer who came to us and said, like, I realize, you know, it's two white men that are tuning these cameras. Like, what do I do? If he didn't bring that up, how would we know? How would we yes. bring more, more people into the fold to help fix it? We can't. So you have to be able to name things, even if it's uncomfortable. And again, I think it gets a lot easier. I look at teams that have been doing this for three years, and that doesn't mean they don't make mistakes, right? They're always learning, but it's a different environment where you see them having those conversations, calling you each other out pushing each other and i think that that's really really incredible to see what was the fix for that pro it's always interesting these things you you don't really think about and and yet once you mention it of course that's a problem the team is really great so we do 
kind of evergreen testing on mm -hmm. on the sensors now and we do testing across i would say the whole array of skin tones yeah. so when the team is doing dog fooding or you know testing user testing we do a lot of testing with our inclusion champions who are 2000 plus googlers who have opted into helping us do adversarial testing so kind of breaking the product before it fixes focus groups regular testing etc and i think that again that like build for everyone with everyone right like now yeah people of color are part of the process. And so they can call things out, they can submit feedback, and we can proactively and intentionally make sure that the cameras are built to work for everyone. Yeah, so so it's not that the two guys working on the camera aren't just testing it with, I'm, I'm making an assumption here that their families are also white. They're not just testing it out on family photos. And I think that's so important because so much of the bias that gets baked into products and into algorithms reflects bias in the real world. There was one point, it was a few years ago, I think LinkedIn has fixed this, but I just got curious when LinkedIn recommends that you connect with people. I wanted to see how many screens I'd have to click through before LinkedIn recommended that I connect with a, with a black person. And it was, I think, eight or not. I mean, it was shocking to me. And I realized that, you know, it would be easy for me to blame LinkedIn. It's probably really the fault of my own network. Then that bias in, in people's network gets reinforced and exaggerated in, a, in an algorithm. And one of the things I really admire about your, your book is you talk about measuring. How do you measure the bias? And I think, on the one hand, it's, it's a risk of the algorithm becomes sexist or racist. On the other hand, it's an opportunity because the metrics are more clear in the algorithm than they ever would be in real life. In fact, here's a gender algorithm that was made clear to me at Google that had a big impact on my life. So I was talking to Hal Varian, who's, who's the chief economist at Google, and we were supposed to be talking about the AdSense algorithm. But somehow we got talking about online dating and the algorithms in online dating. And Hal said, did you know that women disadvantage themselves like 100 to 1 when they date online? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, women will wait and they'll get maybe 10 offers. And they'll choose from, you know, one of those 10 offers. That, <laughs> But men go out and they look at 1,000 <laughs> women. And so they're, they have a big numerical advantage in uh, and who they're choosing. And he said, you know, I bet it happens in the real world too, but you just can't measure it. So talk to me a little bit about how do we measure these things in products? Because it seems like both a risk and an opportunity there. You know, product teams measure a lot of stuff. Um, so I think that this has to be treated just like that. Like you can't fix what yeah. you can't measure. And so you have to have a baseline that you can improve upon. I think that there are certain metrics that are easier to get than others, right? I think that the reason why you want metrics is because you're building for users, right? And you need to understand what users need, what their sentiment yeah. is, like what's working, what's not working. And so yeah. the only way you can do that is to have kind of metrics that matter. Yes. I, I think, you know, Brian Stevenson, talks a lot about getting proximate um, and it's in a different context, but I think that metrics allow you also to get closer to the users, right? And to understand what their experience is like. Like you can't assume that you know if something's working or not without like, all of those types of things. And so yeah, I think it's, it's really about getting outside of yourself and understanding who else. Just because you have a great experience with something doesn't mean I will and vice versa. I think it's really important to kind of at those critical points in the process, whether it's uh, research and design, whether it's user testing, whether it's marketing, making sure that you understand what metrics are important, um, where you have gaps in, in measurement, and committing to getting those on a regular basis, just like any other part of the process that you're measuring. Yeah, and it's so tricky because I think for a lot of people are really reluctant to look at the number, to break the numbers down by gender, by race. And yet, if we don't do that, we won't see where there's difference. So, and you can do that for your products, but you can also do it for your processes, whether it's hiring or promotion or, or whatnot. So how do you get people comfortable breaking their customer satisfaction data down by race or gender or um, ability? 
We want to make sure that we're getting as much feedback as possible. And when you're kind of focusing on the user, right, like it's just about asking who else and asking like which users have we not gotten that feedback from. So Inclusion Champions, I think, is, is a good example of that. It's it's about, okay, we have a lot of people who are doing testing, a lot of people who are dog fooding Google. Do we know who? Yeah. Say a little bit more. Sorry to interrupt. Say a little bit more about what dog. I know what dog fooding is because I worked at Google like you. But not everybody. What, what do you mean when you say dog fooding? So dog fooding comes from the phrase like so you eat your own dog food before you kind of put it out. So dog fooding is all about making sure you're testing and testing rigorously before you kind of launch something out into the world. And so when you think about product inclusion, you know, a lot of people like dog fooding is, is a big part of the culture at Google, but we have to make sure that we're being as inclusive as possible with dog fooding. Right. Um, and so, you know, what we've, we've worked to do is bring in these inclusion champions, right. Who are underrepresented into that process. So it, it's not unknown, like who is dog yes. fooding and who isn't like, we need to know, we need to know if women are dog fooding, if older Googlers are dog fooding, if people with disabilities, yeah. you know, are dog fooding. So you have to be intentional and you have to have baselines around that yeah. stuff so you can get better. And it's hard because Google, at least when I was there was 75% men, right? So when they dog fooded, women were the underrepresented majority, actually, not underrepresented minority. There's slightly more women than men in the world. Black people were dramatically underrepresented, at least when I was, I think it's getting a little bit better. Latinx people were dramatically, dramatically underrepresented at Google. And so fixing that is tricky because the way you get ahead at Google is working on your core projects. And so you don't want to give all this extra work to the people who are underrepresented so they can't get ahead. Like, how have you dealt with that? Yeah, so we, our inclusion champions are all um, volunteers, and so they opt into anything that we're doing. I, yeah, I think, obviously, being <laughs> underrepresented across multiple dimensions of diversity, yes. I, I empathize a ton and, and want to make sure that we're doing it in a thoughtful way. I would say the second thing is we really recognize them as part of the process, right? So That's it's not right. just about you know asking someone to do something and they never hear back as to <laughs> what happened, right? Yeah. Um, it's really about co-creation um, and also recognizing people for the kind of brilliance that they're bringing into the, the design process. And I think the other thing is to making sure making sure that we get user feedback outside of, you know, Google as well. Um, we need to make sure that we're kind of on the ground getting, getting feedback and understanding um, what underrepresented users from all different backgrounds and walks of life are thinking and, and how we can better serve them. One of the things I love about your book is you explain what you did and how other people can do it. And these measures, I think, measurements matter. I think another thing that really matters is words, obviously. And so, so say a little bit more about why you choose the word underrepresented, because I think it's really important uh, to the book and in general. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of terms, you know, that people use around, you know, whether it be minorities or... Or m minoritized, because the, the real problem I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, is that minorities are underrepresented. So black people represent 14% of the U.S. population, but only 5% of employee base in tech. Is that right? I think also it's not a, like a demeaning yeah. term. It's, it's just stating facts. We are underrepresented in the spaces that yes. we're talking about. And so I think, you know, we've definitely looked at a lot of different terms and I think it's, it's a journey, right? Like language is always evolving. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's important to not be disempowering, I guess, is the yes. right word, in terms of language. You want to make sure you're being as empowering and as factual as possible. Another example of that is when people say wheelchair user versus like person who uses yes. a wheelchair. It seems like that's a small thing, but it's actually not. The person is a person first that happens yes. to use a wheelchair, right? So I think language is, is really important even when you're describing work versus like talking directly to someone who may kind of fit into that underrepresented category, because I think it subconsciously changes how you look at a challenge and look at opportunity when you use very specific language. You made that point as I was editing the book. And when we were talking about Zach, the historian who is blind, I was careful 
not to say a blind historian, but a historian who is blind because he's, he's a historian and he's a person. Tell One me. other thing I'll say too on that is there will always be times, like a community isn't a monolith. So there will always be times where you might find someone from a certain community that actually prefers to be named or labeled in a different way. And I think that that's another thing to always remember, like just because I identify myself as a certain way, like you could meet another, you know, black woman that says like, actually, I prefer X, Y, and Z. And that's totally fair. And you should always go with what that, that person says when you're speaking about that person. But I think it's also important to just recognize that, you know, communities aren't a monolith. So what works for yes. some is not going to work for others. Yeah. I, a great example is woman versus girl. Like I really hate, please don't call me a girl. Please call me a woman, but other women feel differently, you know, and it's okay. It's okay. The point around identity is I get to choose who I am and I get to say what pronouns you use when referring to me and what my name is. And it's respect that we all owe one another, I think. It's really important. And, and that we owe our products uh, as well. Another thing that I really was interested in in your book, you write about adversarial testing, which sounds very intriguing to me. <laughs> so, so tell people what is adversarial testing? Yeah, so with our assist, Google Assistant, so it's kind of a voice assistant that lives in a few products, basically what we wanted to do is make sure that when it launched, it wasn't going to say you know, racist, sexist, homophobic, other. Yes. <laughs> so we wanted to make sure that it was as inclusive as possible. So what we thought about was, you know, there's no way that a, a product team can know every negative thing that it, uh, an assistant could say, right? Um, everything to, to exclude. And so again, we brought in our, our inclusion champions and we did what we call adversarial testing. And so adversarial testing is essentially trying to kind of break the product before it launches. And the way that you would do that is for communities that we want to make sure that are feel included to help us create not only block lists, but also things to include. Mm -hmm. So I think it's also really important with product inclusion to balance the challenges with the opportunity, right? There's a ton of opportunity, again, when you kind of look at the power of these groups, if you do build for and with them. It was basically having different groups kind of come in and say, we definitely don't want these you know, terms to be there. Yeah. We definitely do want these types of things. So it's everything from kind of blocking, you know, offensive or inappropriate language to, you know, when you ask it, tell me a, um, a fact about pride or do, uh -huh. black, do black lives matter? What's the answer? What, what does Google Home Mini answer if you, if you ask that question? Yeah, so there, um, I encourage you to check it out after, but it's, okay, it's really, it's really it powerful. Um, like, so we, you know, we just um, kind of iterated on the original answer that, you know, gives you facts and resources. It, um, you know, when you ask how you're doing, um, it was saying, you know, I'm doing okay, but I know there are a lot of people who are, are hurting. So when you think about, again, building for and with and making information universally accessible and useful and, and really being there, making someone feel validated and thought of, I think that, that that's a, a testament to a product team that was really intentional about bringing those voices in to kind of co-create the solution. Thank you so much. Thank you for making Google's products better for everyone and with everyone. Tell us, uh, as, we, as we wrap up, tell us when the book comes out and where people can, can buy it and how they can keep in touch with you. So uh, the book is officially uh, launching August 17th, shipping shortly after. You can keep up with me um, on social media with It's Me, AJB, as in boy, or you can find me at AnnieJeanBaptiste.com. Great. Thank you so much, Annie Jean Baptiste. It was a great pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for joining us. Our podcast features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff, is produced by our director of content, Brandy Neal, and hosted by me, Amy Sandler. Music is by Cliff Goldmacher. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Candor and find us online at RadicalCandor.com. We'll see you soon. <laughs>